tonight on News Center. Faculty and students rally about the proposed budget cuts. Inspirational speakers visit Cal to honor Women's History Month. Students channel their inner female. And we take a look back at the past basketball season. New Center starts right now. Welcome to CUTV News Center for the week of March 24, 2011. I'm Justin Carlo. And I'm Lauren Tarosic. Many Cal U students, faculty, and staff gathered on Tuesday in front of the Natale Student Center for a rally against Governor Corbett's proposal for slashing of the higher education budget by 54%. CUTV reporter Tim Perry was at the event and has more on the story. At the Natale Student Center, the teachers union members wanted to spread the word to students about the proposed 54% budget cut in the state of Pennsylvania. The Association of Pennsylvania State College, University and Faculties held the rally to inform the university community about Governor Tom Corbett's proposed tax cuts. Faculty and students spoke out on their views. Because we want to stop the governor for goodness sakes. The governor is proposing to slash the budget by over 50% to higher education. Ridiculous! You can't get away with that. So we're trying to get people aware of that, send little notices to their state legislators so they can vote on stopping the governor. The cuts have the potential to affect faculty, staff, and may heavily weigh on the student's wallet. It's a simple thought. If we don't stand together as faculty, students, staff, and the administration here at California and across the, the 13 or 14 schools in the state system, we will fail our citizens. A good turnout showed up for the rally, and some students were concerned about the funding cuts. It's just going to be a lot harder to keep up with everything. There's going to be a lot more stress added on to a lot of the students and the parents alike because they have to worry about paying for the school. It's our role. It's our role as students to really turn this, this thing around. The speakers were on both sides of the issue, with the majority of the crowd strongly against the budget cuts. The organizational president, Dr. Michael Slavin, had an estimate of how much it would hurt the average student. If this budget cut passes, it could increase their tuition by 33 percent. 33 percent, a thousand dollars each semester. Each semester, one thousand dollars. It's a ridiculous thing. One student speaker was okay with taking the funding cuts, and felt that the California University of Pennsylvania could weather the storm. You know, and, and, and it's, you know, it's kind of soon to be, you know, you know, burning witches here because, A, this isn't finalized. B, you know, who knows what the campus is going to come up to help subsidize things. It's not too late to still do something about the proposed state budget cut. Just contact your local state representative and let them know how you feel about the issue. For CUTV News Center, I'm Tim Perry. A few weeks back on March 7th, Borough Police responded to multiple calls for a large fight on the 100 block of Wood Street where a man exiting Campy's, an off-campus restaurant and six-pack shop, was attacked by Cal U football player Darnell Harding. When they arrived at the scene, Harding had already fleed to the Brodak Apartments. Tony Whiteleather, Cal U football player, continued the assault. The victim was transported to an area hospital by ambulance. Both Harding and Whiteleather are facing charges including simple assault, disorderly conduct, and harassment. Harding picked up the additional charge of ethnic intimidation. They are awaiting their pre preliminary hearings. U.S. Olympic gold medalist Jessica Mendoza was on campus last Thursday to speak about her experiences during the annual Women's Studies Conference. CUTV's own Allison Steinheiser got the opportunity to speak with Mendoza. With the theme of this year's Women's Studies Conference being gender and sports, the committee wanted a keynote speaker who had experience in this area. Two-time Olympian Jessica Mendoza was the perfect candidate because of her experiences on the field as well as off. When Mendoza is not fielding fly balls, she is heavily involved in charity work, especially with the Women's Sports Foundation. She got involved in the foundation after being invited to an awards event. I actually got invited to one of their awards events and was completely moved by all the things that they were doing for women in sports, for young girls, and really for just getting people healthy. After she attended the event, 
She was inspired by the creator of the foundation and wanted to support the cause. I was very much influenced by Billie Jean King and wanted to help in any way that I could. Mendoza had such an impact on the foundation that she was named the 2008 Sportswoman of the Year. She says this ranks as one of her greatest accomplishments because it is not just about softball. You think about all these amazing women um, and to be able to win, not just because of what I did on the field, but off the field, uh, it was a very exciting moment. Mendoza is very involved in charity events, but she also understands that many athletes are consumed with their sport. For a lot of athletes, they're focused on, on playing and performing. And I wish that more athletes took more responsibility in helping others, especially outside of their sport. Mendoza has seen a change in not only the way softball is perceived off the field, but how the game has evolved on the field. For a long time to play the sport of softball, if you could just hit and field and kind of, you know, maybe be able to run. But now it's about speed. It's about agility. It's about really being an athlete, being balanced. And you look at the women that play now, and they look so fit. One problem facing softball is the elimination of the sport from the Olympics. This is an issue Mendoza feels softball in the United States is ready to handle. I feel like it affects the youth game internationally because most of the funding came from the governments which came from the Olympic movement. But here in the U.S. softball is a huge sport. Everyone plays it and they played it before it was an Olympic sport. Uh, so I feel like it's going to continue to grow and it won't affect it here in the U.S. Mendoza is continuing her softball career playing for the Florida Pride. She's also working as a color analyst for ESPN. Reporting for CUTV News Center, I'm Allison Steinheiser. Continuing with CUTV's Women's History Month coverage, a former Survivor contestant spoke to students about her dream for women in the future. CUTV reporter Zachary Olson has more on the event. As part of Women's History Month at California University, former Survivor contestant Alexis Jones came and spoke at Steel Auditorium about how to realistically achieve your dreams and her company, I Am That Girl. The University of Southern California graduate wanted to inspire women around the world and thought Survivor was just a stepping stone she needed in order to send her message. There was something very specific about that show and about the opportunities that CBS really afforded me that I think put me in a completely different trajectory than I originated. Um, so for me, I was really, really lucky with Survivor. But do I think it was the only way to get me where I wanted to go? Absolutely not. Jones always knew she wanted to inspire people and give a perspective that is unique compared to other inspirational speakers. I'm willing to be honest, and I think there's a lot of people who get up and perform, and I'm not interested in performing. I'm interested in having a conversation um, with students, and I think that's a really different approach. Um, at the end of the day, I would like to think that my stories are unique, but I think it's more in delivery. I have a blast when I'm up there, and I think that that's the thing that's really unique is I happen to find what I absolutely love, and I think it's contagious. Jones's company, I Am That Girl, is designed to inspire confidence for women and men alike and give a new spark to the women's movement. But at the end of the day, I mean, that's kind of more on a smaller scale. My big-time goals is to reignite the women's movement for the 21st century in a really powerful, sexy, trendy, edgy kind of way and to bring men into the conversation. Some of the big differences um, are that our current generation really struggles with this uh, phenomenon of mean girls. I don't think that that was something that in the past that they struggled with as much. Um, and I think that we have a unrealistic, unattainable expectation of beauty that they also didn't necessarily deal with that we're really bombarded with all the time. For more information on I Am That Girl, visit the website at www.iamthatgirl.com or search it through Facebook and Twitter. For CUTV News Center, I'm Zachary Olson. So Lauren, it seems that every week we're talking about either hot weather or cold weather and it just goes back and forth. Right? I know. I'm getting so tired of it. My sinuses <laughs> are hating me. I'm ready for spring to come. I just want sure. it to be warm consistently. Am I ready? I agree. <laughs> I agree. Find out what's going on with this up and down weather when we return with student meteorologist C.J. Hawley. Welcome to the Cal U Weather Center. I am Steve, Chief Student Meteorologist C.J. Hawley here with your weather headlines for this week. We are very cold out there. Unfortunately, Punxsutawney Phil may have lied to us this past uh, February, and that could bring us some spring snow into the weekend. And is there going to be any warm relief in store? Find out all that and more when CUTV News Center returns. <laughs> There is a university built on an uncommon dedication to the whole student, where core values of integrity, civility, and responsibility are not just taught, but integrated into academic experience.
creating a learning environment for personal life as well as professional life. California University of Pennsylvania. Welcome back to CUTV News Center. Let's go ahead and take a look at your almanac from yesterday. Long ago are the highs of yesterday as yesterday we hit 69 degrees with a low of 38 this morning. But that's going to be pretty much the highest we're going to see today. As we look at the records, we're well off that the rainfall yesterday with those tornadoes that came in through is just under an inch. But long ago, like I said, are those temperatures of 69 is this is going to be the trend over the next five to seven days out here. Pittsburgh just below freezing Morgantown at 32. Those temperatures we did have yesterday down here in Virginia, down to our south Martinsburg at 37. So they're feeling the same thing we are. And that's due to that exiting uh, low that comes in and also ushers down this dry air. As we can see with these dew points, 25 for Pittsburgh. Meadville at 19, so there's much drier air, much colder air out there once that low just kicked out with that cold front that brought all those storms. And here's the remnants. As compared to yesterday, we are down 11 degrees from yesterday. Here's the big jump. Parkersburg, man, they were in shorts yesterday. Now they're in parkas today as they dropped down 34 degrees as compared to yesterday. And here's the reason why. As you see these exiting low that kicks off of Boston, that's not going to be the problem for us anymore as that precipitation is going to kick out. And we're going to zoom into the west here because we actually have some some footage, well, not footage, but some problems out here. Crescent City out here in California has gotten basically three months of straight rain. So, And it's been a lot of rain, much like we saw yesterday at just about an inch pretty much every day. So they're having natural floodings over there. And it's monsoon-like symptoms, but they're really not um, – in the monsoon season. But as we zoom back into Pittsburgh, we've got clear skies. So thankfully for us, even though the cold has been ushered in, as we head into Futurecast, we're going to look and see how much rain we're going to look at over the next couple days. Not going to be much. Basically, Saturday and Sunday is going to be the norm. Friday, we get this high that builds in. And you can see the rain coming in off the west. And that's going to bring us our rain late Saturday night. I'm talking midnight, 11 o'clock, probably the earliest as that ushers in. It kicks out on Sunday as well. Monday and latter part of Sunday look really, really good for now as that another high pressure builds in. So tonight, we're looking at 19 partly cloudy skies as we had that exiting low and that high building in. Tomorrow, 40, mostly sunny, but it's going to be chilly as we have that cold air mass set in place. And tomorrow night, 22 and mostly cloudy as we start to get the build in for that next system that shoots in on Saturday. So here we're looking at the five day Calcast Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We're looking into the high 30s, low 40s. But here's the precip that comes in on Sunday. It's going to be a rain snow mix in the mountains. You're going to get snow down in the valleys. You're going to get rain Monday and Tuesday in the 40s with some sunshine. So it's looking like we're just going to have low 30s and 40s for the you know next five days. But Wednesday, we might be getting some relief back into the 50s. Uh, some models are looking that way. So hopefully we'll get back into that. I hope it stays warm. I mean, you guys have been lying to me here. You're, gonna, you're all turning into good meteorologists. <laughs> I don't know what's going on with the weather. Yeah, ever. To Poxy Tawny Phil, he did lie to us. So. Do you think by Wednesday after that will be smooth rolling into summer? Or We're what? in transition season. You never know what's going to happen, so hopefully though. I don't like to hear that, CJ. <laughs> Sorry. All right, thank you. thank you. When we come back, Gloria Stone has your entertainment report. Welcome back to News Center. I'm Gloria Stone with your entertainment report. To celebrate R Women's Month, the Women's Center has organized the play The Vagina Monologues. Under the direction of Kay Doran, students were able to be involved and share this powerful message. I believe very strongly in the message, and I believe that people need to hear these women's stories. And I believe that it's one of the best things I've ever done with my life, and it's really empowered me and made me feel at one with myself and other women. The Vagina Monologues is a play based on interviews that the writer Eve Ensler asked numerous women who are diverse in race, age, and location. Each skit is based on an individual or grouping of those people. I've seen it two years before 
this year and um, I just I was really inspired to do it and I'm, I'm really glad that I did it. I do a lot of stuff through the marketing, doing stuff in the union, trying to pull people in and just explaining what vagina monologue, monologues is because a lot of people have an idea of what it is and it's not correct. So just the education stuff through the emails, Facebook, that kind of thing and just try to spread the word in a positive way to educate people. Other than the play itself, items will be sold with a percentage of profits going to the women of Haiti. The Vagina Monologues will be held tonight and tomorrow at 7 p.m. in the Blaney Theater. Season 12 of Dancing with the Stars is underway and full of surprises after the premiere Monday night. Ralph Machio and Christy Alley were the top two in points with scores of 24 and 23 out of 30. It was talk show host Wendy Williams who struggled to wow the judges with her performance, giving her 14 out of 30. However, after the first week of the show, no star was eliminated. All competitors are looking forward to improving and bringing their all to win the competition. Pittsburgh Steeler Heinz Ward said, I know I can do better and hope to improve as the show goes on. Don't miss the next episode of Dancing with the Stars Monday night at 8 on ABC. Chris Brown is known for his troubled past, but after his Tuesday appearance on Good Morning America, the star has another violent act to add to his rap sheet. After being asked questions about his relationship with ex-girlfriend Rihanna, the singer left the studio angry, resulting in him trashing his dressing room. Brown destroyed the window in the, in the room, leaving glass in the, on the sidewalk of 43rd Street near Times Square. Charges of vandalism were not filed against him. The legendary actress Elizabeth Taylor died peacefully Wednesday morning at Cedar sinai Medical Center. Taylor passed away due to congestive heart failure, which had her admitted to the hospital six weeks ago. Throughout her career, she won two Oscars and did large amounts of charitable work. Looking at the Vulcan calendar, the Student Activities Board is sponsoring a trip this Saturday to the Andy Warhol Museum. The cost of the tour for Cal students is $5 and non-students $7. Buses will leave at 11.30 behind the union. If, students, if interested students can sign up at the Natalie Student Center info desk. Spaces are limited. Also on Saturday, Cal will be holding their first Zoombathon fundraiser for the American Cancer Society from 9 to noon. Other than the Latin-inspired dance fitness program, there will be a Chinese auction and Zumba items for sale, which all proceeds go to the Cancer Society. You can register for the Zumba a Subathon at Heron Hall for $10 up until the start of the event. Coming to the Vulcan Theater this week is the sequel to Meet the Parents, Little Falkers, starring Ben Steelers, Robert De Niro, and Owen Wilson. The sequel takes place 10 years and two children's later. Greg has finally jumped hurdles into a good relationship with his father-in-law, Jack. However, with the twins' birthday bash coming soon, can Greg pass Jack's final test? To find out if he succeeds, showtimes are at 4 and 8 p.m. So I'm really upset that I'm missing the Zoomathon Saturday for work. I know. It's going to be a really great time. I wish you could come. I hear you're the one organizing it, is it? I am helping organize it, and it's going great. Right now we have 96 people signed up, so hopefully it will be a success. Is it too late to sign up? It is not too late to sign up. You can sign up up until the event starts. Registration is at 8.30 Saturday morning. If you haven't signed up already, get a t-shirt. All for charity. We should sign up. <laughs> I wish I could. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Gloria. Thanks. When we return, Will Moore has your sports report. Stay tuned. You are watching CUTV, California University Television. Hello, welcome back to the CUTV News Center. My name is Will Moore, and this is the Vulcan Sports Report. With the breaking of spring comes the conclusion of the 2011 Vulcan basketball season. CUTV had complete coverage of the Vulcans' run through the PSAC West in a season that saw its share of highs and lows. ...of seven new players to the Vulcans' roster this season came great optimism, but also great concern. Could so many new faces in key roles come together to build a winning team? After posting an 8-6 record in the PSAC West and a 15-12 overall record, the answer was yes. 
After defeating then number 15 Bowie State handily and capturing the Salem International Classic, the Vulcans started PSAC West play by going 5-3 and three before dropping three straight to Edinburgh, IUP, and Mercyhurst. Seemingly out of contention, California responded. The Vulcans would go on to defeat Slippery Rock, Gannon, Clarion, and Lockhaven to qualify for the PSAC Conference playoffs. In their first appearance in two seasons, California would drop a heartbreaking loss to the eventual champion Crimson Hawks to close out IUP's Memorial Fieldhouse, as well as the Vulcan season. Despite the early exit, there were bright spots to the Vulcan season. Forwards Rashad Hatton and Steve Swick were named to the All-PSAC West team, with Hatton leading the Vulcans in rebounding, free throw percentage, and three-point percentage. Swick, a junior transfer from the University of Akron, led the Vulcans in rebounds per game with 12.2 average. With all the three players returning next season, the Vulcans look to field an even better team and season next year. Yesterday, Enrico Iso, a trainer for the Pittsburgh Steelers and the only female trainer in the NFL, spoke at Cal U. CUTV's Clinton Logan was in attendance and has more on the story. As part of Women's History Month here at California University of Pennsylvania, the only full-time female athletic trainer in the NFL came to speak to students about her profession. Ariko Iso of Tokyo, Japan, is the only female athletic trainer in the NFL. Iso joined the Steelers organization in 2002 as a full-time athletic trainer after interning with the Steelers for the previous two years. Iso took some time to visit California University of Pennsylvania to talk to Cal students, teachers, and even students from Clarion University about her daily routine and her journey to be the first female athletic trainer in the NFL. People mention about fe being a female and working in a professional level, but uh, to me, to overcome being a non-U.S. citizen, uh, to find a job and uh, being evaluated as, or you know, considered as a candidate, that was a harder to do, but uh, as a female, you know, I'm asking the same opportunity as male, so I'm trying to work same as male. Like, you know, it has to go both ways. That's always back in my head, but, you know, that nothing too special, I, I believe. We got a chance to talk to one of the athletic trainers here on campus to see what they thought about ESO's presentation. I got some good take-home information for the students for our clinic ed classes. Um, a lot of them dream of going into the NFL, dream of going into the pros. I don't think they quite realize what goes into it and the hard work that goes into it. More importantly, I don't think they realize the stepping stones that go into it. They just think you kind of apply and next thing you know you've got the job. Although the NFL is in a lockout, that has not stopped the athletic trainers from their normal schedule. However, that may change after the NFL draft. For CUTV News Center, I'm Clinton Logan. Early the, earlier this week, California University named Peter Latournu as the new head coach of the Vulcans volleyball team and the sixth in team history. He previously coached at Division III Frostburg State University, where he built an impressive program that went 144 and 61 under his tenure. Latournu led Frostburg to an 18-0 conference record in each of the past two seasons. This season, Latournu was named the Capital Athletic Conference Coach of the Year. All right, guys. So, uh, talking about California on uh, uh, stepping up to the the next level. Uh, after California, we've seen some players with the Pittsburgh Power making an impact this right. season. Kevin McCabe and uh, Gary Butler uh, with the new startup team up in Pittsburgh. Uh, they've been putting, putting on quite a show so far. They're one and one so far, going to travel to uh, Milwaukee this weekend for their first away game. That'll be Monday night. You know, uh, how about Kevin McCabe and this team so far? Well, you know, Will, I've never, I can't say that I've seen arena football, especially not in person. But I am looking forward to going to see the team because our own um, Veronica Busilli is on the dance team. And so, yeah. you know, I'll go to see. I'll watch the football while I'm there. <laughs> you know, I figure I owe them that. Yeah, I heard that. Con congrats to Veronica. We can't wait to get to a game. I've never seen one either. So uh, we're going to have to go. Uh, it's a whole different breed of football. It's a lot faster. It's really <laughs> exciting. High-paced offense. So. All right. Thanks, Will. No problem. <laughs> That will do it for this edition of News Center. Don't forget, you can check us out, check out News Center anytime online. You can visit our page by going to youtube.com and searching CUTV News Center.
We'll see you next week.